so my name is Alex Leong. Uh, I am from Buoyant, uh, and I'm going to be talking about uh, Linkerd. Um, this is going to be a pretty hands-on, pretty interactive uh, session. So if you've got your laptops and you want to follow along, um, there'll be instructions for how to do that. And I really encourage it, because it'll be more fun, and I think you'll get more out of it. Um, <coughs> So just by a show of hands, how many people have already heard of Linkerd? Uh, a few. And then uh, of those people, has anyone tried it out, given it a, given it a spin? Not really? OK, great. That's awesome, because that's what we're going to do today. Um, so like I said, my name's Alex. Um, I work at Buoyant. I work on Linkerd, um, which is an open source project that uh, I'm really passionate about. I think it's really cool. And I hope uh, by the end of this session, you guys will think it's really cool, too. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you like. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, Linkerd at a really high level and explain kind of what it is and why you should care about it and what it's good for, what it's useful for. Um, and I'm going to try and go through that pretty quickly so we can go right to the uh, tutorial. Um, and so if you want to get that um, kind of loaded up and ready to go, um, you can go to this uh, GitHub repo, and there will be all the instructions for you to follow along. But we can, uh, we can talk a little bit first before we get to that. OK, so what is, what is Linkerd? What is this thing? It is a service mesh for cloud native applications. OK, what's that? Um, that's a lot of buzzwords. So what is it actually? Uh, it's a layer 5 proxy. So it's an application that runs alongside your application and uh, proxies requests uh, that your application wants to make. So if you want to make a network call, you want to make an HTTP call or a thrift call or a gRPC call, you send that call to Linkerd uh, instead of the final destination, and, and it will proxy it along. Um, it's a layer 5 proxy, which means it talks these like high-level languages, high-level protocols like HTTP and HTTP2. Um, not raw TCP. So this is not just packets, but this is uh, requests and responses. So these kind of atomic units of you send a request, you get a response back. Um, that's the unit of communication. Um, it's based on an open source library called Finagle. Uh, it was originally developed at Twitter and now sees use at a number of really large companies in production. It does huge amounts of traffic every day. is very battle tested, um, very production uh, tested. Um, but unlike Finagle, it's not a library. It's a standalone process. So this runs uh, separately from your application um, alongside it, and you communicate, it, communicate with it uh, over, over the protocol, whether that's HTTP or HTTP2 um, or, or Thrift or gRPC. OK, so why, why do you want this thing? Why introduce a separate proxy into your system? What's the point? Um, well. As we move to more decoupled applications and we decompose things from you know, a single application that's running as a single process to you know, uh, service-oriented architectures or microservices where you have a number of different services that live in scheduled environments like Kubernetes or Mesos, things move around and things become more complicated. And so you need to take care of service discovery. Your app needs some way of knowing where all the other services uh, are currently running and how to send traffic to them. And so that's one of the things that Linkerd does, is it will keep track of, of service discovery. It'll know where everything is currently running. And you can send your request to Linkerd, and it will appropriately route it to the correct location. And that's a piece of logic that you don't need to build into your application, because it's not really part of your application. It's, it's kind of an infrastructure concern. Um, you know, in a similar vein, you're going to be running multiple replicas of all your services for, you know, uh, for reliability and uh, for scalability. Um, and so, of course, you need to load balance over all of those. And load balancing, you know, is a simple, simple in concept, but can be difficult in, in reality because you need to determine how much traffic do you send to each replica. What do you do when certain replicas start becoming slower? What do you do when certain replicas start failing? Um, and so, by building a lot of uh, really intelligent load balancing into Linkerd, you can really bring down your tail latencies by routing around slowness. So when certain replicas become slow, you send them less traffic, you route to the faster ones, give the slower ones some time to recover, you know, back traffic off of them, and let them you know, come out of whatever problem they're having, whether it's GC or whether it's network congestion or you know, noisy neighbors. Um, retries are something that you know, in most systems you probably want. You probably don't want to just give up at the first failure. 
Um, but retry logic can sometimes be a little tricky to get right. Um, so that's another thing that when you move it into a separate process whose you know, sole purpose is reliable communication, it's one less thing your application has to worry about, and it's something that you know, Linkerd is built to do well. Um, similar to, to, to load balancing, uh, circuit breakers allow you to cut off traffic to endpoints that have become unhealthy. So if certain replicas start failing for, for some reason, um, you're gonna, your success rate is going to hurt as you send traffic to those. So if you can cut traffic off there, route to the healthy replicas, uh, then your success rate is, is not going to suffer as a result of that. Um, so that's you know, an absolutely like, really critical aspect of reliability is to be able to, to be able to handle these kind of failures because you know, as things become more complicated, these failures are, are inevitable. You know, things will go wrong. And then it's crazy to, to, not, to run a complicated system or e even a simple system and not have you know, observability into it. But this can be hard to do. You know, you're going to instrument your app, perhaps, but it's, you know, you're not necessarily going to instrument it with all the possible pieces of data that you want. Um, if you have multiple applications running in different languages, you'll probably be using different uh, libraries for metrics in each one. You won't get a uniform view of your entire system. Um, what's nice about using Linkerd is that once you're sending traffic to it, it will collect a huge amount of very, very rich data um, and expose that. And it does this uniformly across all of your applications, you know, regardless of what language each of them is written in. So even for polyglot applications, you get this uniform view of, of the traffic flowing through your system um, at the request and service level. So you know how many requests, what's the success rate, what's the latency on a per-service basis, who's talking to who. Um, you know, it really gives you a rich uh, idea of what's going on. And distributed tracing is also part of that. Um, you want to be able to see how requests are flowing through your system. You know, where is the slowness coming from? You know, the more components in your system, the more difficult this is. And, and that's where distributed tracing really becomes super useful. Um, of course, building that into your application can be you know, annoying or difficult. The libraries may or may not exist in the language you're using. Uh, so I think that's a really compelling reason to put that logic into a separate proxy that runs alongside your app. And it does a whole bunch of other stuff, too. Security, timeouts, deadlines. Uh, there's lots of really, really nice features that can really benefit you when you're running you know, a complex application. Um, but you don't necessarily want to build it into the application itself. You want to focus on you want to focus on the app and what it's supposed to do, rather than the network communication layer. And it's complicated, right? All of these problems, you know, they're solvable on their own, but they can be a little bit tricky to get right. And you know, they may uh, take a few attempts. They may, you know, cause outages or incidents if you, you know, had a subtle, a subtle bug. Um, and you sh really, realistically, shouldn't be reinventing this wheel every time. Uh, and that's why we think it's really great that we can rely on a library like Finagle that's been so heavily tested, um, and you know, we know that it's you know, super solid. So by relying on that and give, putting that everywhere in your system, you get this really uniform, uh, this really uniform way of dealing with, with network communication. And you do it in a way that's out of process so that you can use it across your whole system, um, and you don't have to reinvent that wheel. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that Linkerd is a service mesh, um, and that's kind of a term that's becoming more popular. Uh, you may have heard at GlueCon, uh, Istio uh, launched their service mesh for Kubernetes. Uh, we've been talking about service meshes for a while. Um, so what is a service mesh, and, and where does that term come from? Um, the way we think about it is that Linkerd should be part of the infrastructure. Um, all of these network uh, concerns, your app shouldn't have to deal with. So when you do something like run one Linkerd instance on each host in your, in your application, uh, they kind of form this, this mesh through which network communication happens. So your application just has to send its requests to its local host Linkerd, and then that request will kind of go to the, to the Linkerd on the destination host, and then finally to, uh, to the application. And so all the cross-host traffic is handled and wrapped by Linkerd. Um, and, it, and that's where this like, concept of a mesh comes from. What's cool about this is that you get metrics and observability on both sides. Uh, so you get you know, metrics from the client's perspective and metrics from the server's perspective. And you can really see uh, how things are, are happening and what's going wrong. And is it slow here? Is it slow there? Is success rate different on one side or the other? Um, 
And you can also, because you're wrapping the cross-host traffic, this is a perfect place to do things like add security. So you can add TLS and encrypt the cross-host host traffic without your application ever needing to be aware of it. And I think that's kind of the big goal here, is that your application shouldn't have to worry about all of these you know, difficult but important network concerns like retries and timeouts and deadlines and TLS and you know, uh, observability. You should just send your requests and, and Linkerd should do the right thing. And that's the idea behind the service mesh. And this works really great in scheduled environments. Kubernetes, uh, for example, you can deploy Linkerd as a daemon set. It goes across every host, one on every host, and, and it's just there. It's just part of the infrastructure, and you can use it and take advantage of it. OK, so now that we've kind of talked about a little bit about what it is, let's, let's try it out. Um, so if you want to follow along, you can go to this GitHub repo, and there will be instructions, or you can just follow along on screen. Oops. Hey, is that big enough everyone can see? Let's. OK, um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create um, a couple of services just running in Python uh, in order to demonstrate how we would use Linkerd to, to talk to these services. So in this example, we're going to be running everything kind of locally on, on my computer or on your computer. Um, but in a real setup, we would probably deploy this to, to Marathon or Mesos or Kubernetes or whatever you are in the cloud. Um, but other than that, it's going to be very similar. Uh, so I'm just going to create two directories, cat and dog. Uh, oops. Uh, and I'm just going to put a file in each one uh, for, uh, for the Python um, services to serve. So if we go into cat, we're going to create uh, index.txt or .html. And we're going to put the word cat in there. And then in dog, we'll do the same thing. Dog. Um, and then we'll just start up a simple Python server. So this is just going to serve the word um, cat. And then we'll do the same thing uh, whoops, to serve the word dog. OK, so we've got two services running. Um, if we curl localhost on port 7777, we get cat. And on 7778, we get dog. So we've got our two, our two instances of the service running. And, and I have them returning different things just so we can tell which one's which. Um, OK, so now we're going to uh, download Linkerd. Uh, so let's go back into that directory. And I've already got Linkerd downloaded here. Um, but if you don't, there's a curl command. They can grab it off of the releases page from GitHub. Um, and Linkerd always needs a config file to run. And this config file is going to configure you know, what it does, how it behaves, uh, and, and how it proxies traffic. So let's go ahead and create that. Um, so to start, we're going to give it a list of namers. And uh, namers are the things that Linkerd uses to talk to service discovery. So if you're running in Kubernetes, you would have a namer that talks to the Kubernetes API, and it's going to tell you where all the services are currently running. Um, if you are in a Mesos Marathon, you're going to talk to have a namer that talks to the Marathon API, and it's going to tell you where everything's running. Uh, it can also talk to console um, and another other uh, Zookeeper, a bunch of service discovery backends. Uh, in our case, though, since we're just running locally, we're going to use the uh, FS namer. And that just uh, looks at some files on your local file system uh, that list out where things are running. So kind of for the purposes of demo and example. And uh, I'll give it a root of disco. That's where it's going to look for these files. Uh, and then Linkerd needs to be configured with a list of routers. And these are kind of the, the main units of Linkerd that accept traffic in and proxy it out. Uh, so in our case, we're going to use HTTP as the protocol. Um, 
and we're going to create a server that listens on port 4140. Um, and we're going to give it something called a D tab. And these are like the routing rules that tell Linkerd where to send the traffic that it receives. Um, and we're going to just start with the simplest D tab there is, which is just to use that file system namer. Um, and the D tab syntax is a little bit complicated, a little bit tricky, uh, but there's lots of documentation online. Um, and it's really uh, pretty simple once you get the hang of it. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, some telemetry. I'm going to add a uh, something called the uh, recent requests telemeter. And this is just going to keep a log of all the recent requests, uh, just kind of to, so we can see what's going on. OK, so I've got a config file. Um, that's great. Um, now, I mentioned in that config file, I was going to create a disco directory that is going to act as our kind of stand-in for service discovery. And that's going to tell us where everything is running. So let's create that. Uh, so we'll create a directory called disco. Um, and then uh, in there, we'll create a file called animal. And this is our service, you know, our animal service. So you've got multiple services running in your, in your system. Um, this is the animal service. And uh, we're going to list out where it's running. And in our case, we've got two instances of it running, one on port 777 and one on port 7778. OK, so that's our service discovery. Um, like I said, in, in a real production system, you'd use Kubernetes or you'd use console or you'd use uh, a real service discovery backend. Um, but this will serve for our demo purposes. Um, and then let's start up Linkerd. So we just start Linkerd, give it that config file, and hopefully I didn't make any mistakes. Uh-oh. So we can just take a look at this error message here. And we can see that I made a typo here. Um, I said namer when it really should be namers, plural. So we can just fix that up. Whoops. So just change namer to namers and try that again. Uh, oh, and again, I did the same thing. I said router instead of, oops, routers. This is the risk of live, uh, live demos. Uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, server instead of servers. Oh, phew. OK, we're running. So let's try sending some traffic. Um, so by default, Linkerd is going to route based on the host header. So if we send a request, now remember I started up Linkerd listening on port 4140. Um, and if we specify a host header as animal, which means I'd like to talk to the animal service, please, it's going to look up in uh, that file, th that animal file we created, where is the animal service running, and it's going to load balance over all of the replicas there. So if we keep sending traffic, we'll see some cats and some dogs because we'll go to those two different Python services that we, we ran. Um, another uh, kind of cool trick that we can do here is that if we use the HTTP proxy uh, environment variable, then uh, we can just curl animal like this. And that's going to be equivalent. That's going to set the host header. But this is a nice way of integrating Linkerd with kind of existing apps that you don't want to modify. Um, if you just pass in this HTTP proxy uh, environment variable, then you kind of don't need to change the code. Um, everything will just pick that up and, and just work. So 
uh, it just works like that. Um, so let's send some more traffic. Uh, so I'll just start a while loop here and uh, sending lots of traffic to, to the two services th going through Linkerd. And uh, let's take a look at the Linkerd dashboard. So by default, it's running on port 9990. Uh, and this gives kind of a picture of, of everything that's going on in this, in this Linkerd. So we see we're doing about 50 requests per second. Success rate is 100%, which is great. Um, we get kind of this live view. Here are all the clients that uh, Linkerd has provisioned. So right now, there's just the animal client for talking to the animal service, uh, which it looks up in uh, that file system uh, directory. Um, success rates at 100%, which is good. We see uh, a table of uh, latencies here, latency histograms. Um, so really rich data. Um, and then we also see here that there are two of two endpoints available. So we're talking to two services, and they're both healthy, uh, and everything is great. Um, but what happens if it's not great? So let's go back to our, uh, to our terminal here. And uh, let's kill one of those services. So we'll kill one of the Python services. And immediately we see we've gone uh, from raining cats and dogs to, to just dogs. Uh, and if we go to our uh, dashboard, uh, we see we're now at endpoints available one of two. So a few things to note. Um, there was no drop in success rate. There were no requests dropped. Um, Linkerd just you know, immediately detected that one of those services was not healthy and uh, just simply used the one that was. Um, and we see that and we see that it, it knows that there's only one of two endpoints available. Um, and so that's taking advantage of the circuit breakers that I mentioned earlier. Um, if we want to bring the cat service back up, We bring the service back up, and uh, Linkerd should pick that up. And eventually, uh, it'll be sending these probes, these occasional probes, to the service to see, is it healthy? Is it back? Is it alive? And, uh, and once it detects that, it should bring this back up to 2 of 2. Eventually. Uh, in the meantime, we can take a look at some of the other uh, things that are in this dashboard. Uh, so this is the DTAB uh, area. This is kind of where we can see our routing rules, and we can see how, how things play out. I mentioned that DTAB syntax earlier. Um, if you give it a service name like animal, you can see exactly how that request is going to be routed. Uh, so you can see uh, that it's going to use that rule from the DTAB that we defined, and then here are the uh, endpoints that it's going to route to. Um, we can also take a look at that uh, those recent requests that I mentioned. We set up that that log of recent requests, and here they are. So this is a great way of kind of figuring out what's going on in your system. Um, for all the requests that comes in, this is going to show us where they came from, uh, what's what uh, server they came into Linkerd from, um, and then kind of how that how that routing happened. So it was assigned to this name, and it was routed to this uh, client. And finally, it was sent off to this destination. Um, and if we want to go even deeper and, and see even more in-depth information, um, all of this is coming from those rich metrics that I mentioned. Um, uh, so every instance of Linkerd is going to expose a huge number of, of really detailed metrics about how, how the system is working. So we've got all of these you know, JVM level metrics about Linkerd itself that, that talk about, you know, uh, how much memory it's using and, and GC and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and then we also have all of this uh, client level and service level data about connect latency and about, you know, uh, number of requests. Um, and here in the load balancer section, we can see that there are two available endpoints. Oh, so if we go back, we would have seen that's back to two of two. 
Um, and if we go back to our, our curl loop, we see both cats and dogs are back in there. So that's completely recovered. Um, and you know this 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 data is so invaluable for things like alerting dashboards. Um, if you aggregate this across Linkerd's, you get this really really rich information that tells you, at a you know from a, a high level, uh, what is your service doing? Where is the traffic going? Where are the problems? Uh, where is the root cause of a problem? Um, you know, retries, where are retries happening? So it's just, it's a huge amount of, of really, really great data. Okay, so that's kind of the tutorial that I wanted to go through. I just wanted to show you how we could get Linkerd up and running, um, how we could send traffic through it, and what benefits it could give us in terms of reliability um, and observability, um, and kind of and and hopefully show you that in, in a cloud environment, you know, that's going to be super super useful um, and and uh, really kind of integral to making things, making sure that things uh, can handle failures gracefully and and can reduce tail latency and, and stuff like that. Um, there's lots of places to learn more about Linkerd if, if you're interested. Um, we've got a really active Slack that uh, people are constantly in there asking questions and getting help and helping each other out, uh, which is really awesome. Um, we've got a discourse forum, uh, which is another great place to ask questions and, and, uh, and, and get help. Um, and then I especially want to point out um, that bottom link there, blog.buoyant.io. Uh, we've got a really great blog series. We've always got really great blogs going up there uh, that go really in depth into various use cases. Um, so we've got one series in particular about using Linkerd on Kubernetes um, that goes into a lot of detail with really great examples um, on how you would use it for TLS, how would you would use it to add reliability, how you would do ingress, how you would do um, CI, CD, uh, staging, all kinds of really, really cool use cases. Uh, so I highly recommend checking that out. Uh, give it a read and see if there's anything uh, there that is interesting to you. Um, and then with that, uh, are there any questions? And we have a microphone here, so let me pass the microphone to you for questions for Alex. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, one thing is, how does the circuit breaker works right now? Like, let's say if the load is there, okay, can I configure like the threshold values? I see uh, this kind of functionality that is there in Netflix uh, high mm -hmm. and you have a high dashboard mm -hmm. where I can configure the high commands, right? Like uh, if there is a certain threshold of uh, bad request, that's when I break the circuit breaker and then it actually like brings back the commands upfront. So do we have such functionality in this? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it is, it's configurable. Um, in your Linkerd config, you can specify whether you want um, to look at consecutive failures and trigger on that, whether you want to look at percentage of failures in a certain window, time window, or number of requests window. Um, right now, that's configurable kind of only statically in the config file, but that's kind of one of the next steps that we're working on is to, to move that and kind of all of the things in the config file really out into an API where these things can be updated at runtime. Another question. Um, you mentioned when you're running multiple Linkerd um, instances across your environment, do those aggregate into a different control panel or overview, or do you have to go to each one individually, or is that more of an enterprise offering to, to have that window? Um, yeah, so there's a few things. Um, one of the things I didn't talk about today is, is a service uh, that works with, Namerd called, or with Linkerd called Namerd. Um, and that acts as kind of a centralized place for routing policy. So those D tabs that I was talking about, you can store those and edit those in a centralized place, and those will get fanned out to all the Linkerds. Um, for other kinds of config, uh, this is kind of what I what I just mentioned. We're trying to move more and more out of the config file and, and into centralized APIs to give you uh, kind of global control uh, over what's happening. On the observability side. Um, what the kind of recommended pattern is is to have something like um, Prometheus or or some kind of stats scraper uh, collect metrics from all the Linkerds and aggregate those into a dashboard. And we have some examples of that as well. Um, I mean, 
in what sense does it work with Cloud Foundry? These, you can run Linkerd kind of in any environment. It's, it's, it's a proxy that will run alongside your app. Um, we have specific integrations for, for things like Kubernetes. Uh, I don't think we have anything specific for Cloud Foundry, but you know, it should run anywhere. Okay, any other questions for Alex? Another one in the back. Um, <clears throat> what's your tested scale? It sounds like a, you have to keep a lot of state between all of the processes. So I'm curious as to how wide you can cast this. Um, depends what you mean by scale. I mean, we have uh, Linkerd's can serve, I don't remember the benchmarks now, but I think tens of uh, thousands of requests per second from a single Linkerd instance. Um, and then in terms of number of instances, uh, we've seen uh, deployments with hundreds or thousands of instances across a cluster. Um, is that kind of what you meant by scale? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> okay, other questions for Alex? All right, Alex, thank you very much.